many, many, many years ago for me, but, but last year we started this uh, exhibit on Hawaii contemporary. And last year I chose a few uh, artists and somebody came to me and said, is that a contemporary artist? Talking about one of the artists. And then uh, this year some of the artists that I invited themselves said, what do you mean by contemporary artists? They were invited, but they were asking, what do you want? So I think this is a question that we might all have at this point. And uh, so I talked to Dick Nelson, who is going to help us maybe just a little bit to clarify this question. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to uh, start by thanking the Viewpoints Gallery, but I, <laughs> this woman puts me through more work. You can't believe I would have a vacation of a life if it weren't up for this gallery here. But uh, I, I want you to know, if you haven't already realized it, there's no gallery that I know of anywhere that has produced as many supporting elements as far as really trying to raise the bar and of consciousness, not only with the artists, but also with the public. And uh, I applaud their efforts. Uh, as I look through the sea of humanity here tonight, I think I know almost all of you. Is there anyone here who is not a student of mine at one time or another? <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> But speaking of, of students, this gentleman over here, Steve Goldstein, we found out at a dinner party the other night that he and I were, in fact, in the same art history class at Yale, not knowing. He was downstairs. I was with the grad students upstairs. And I always wondered who this wild guy was down there that was interrupting. But the reason we found out, we were talking about our mentor, who was probably the world authority on architecture and a historian. And uh, my goodness, I said, he fell off the stage in the middle of a lecture. And Steve said, I was there. And that was the first time we had crossed paths. But a lot of cross-pollinization here. We have not only a lot of students that I've uh, manhandled over the years. I have one here who I actually kicked out of class, Christy Vale, and for a very good reason. <laughs> you know, also, when, when a judge points at you, I, I know that I'm in trouble. Okay, I thought you were here to defend me tonight, but okay. But uh, uh, do any of you have any questions? Wow, that's amazing. No questions at all. Not yet. We, we might later on. Well, why did you come here if you didn't have a question? <laughs> oh, no, not you. <laughs> can, can you hear all right? Yeah, not fairly good enough, but why was Joel going out on and on about a contemptible artist? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, we've got a lot of uh, detractors. That Jack Vale, John Vale, Judge Vale, we've got two judges sitting here together, uh, was in my Marine Corps recon unit. And he's never forgiven me. He, he uh, pushed him out of one of our aircraft, perfectly good aircraft, and his parachute opened all right, but he landed pretty hard that day. And, uh, Uh, we have some out-of-towners here? No out-of-towners. Yes, come on, admit it, guys. For Canadians in oh, snowbirds, yeah. Okay. You're not going to... They just left very good weather, as you know. It's warmer, eh? Yeah, eh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I'm, I'm curious. Melissa. 
When did you sneak in? You were not supposed to be here. I, we crossed you off the list. Okay. Uh, anyway, I, I feel like I'm with family here, and that's dangerous, you know, because uh, I let down my guards. But Jack, no paper gliders during the, the presentation. Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, Karen Bennett, or maybe you don't, makes my day look pretty good because as a former engineer of Boeing, she brings to my act, uh, I think, the kind of stability, and I wish you could see the amount of corrections she has to go through when I do a handout for the class. Uh, we were going until 45 minutes before I was to pick her up to bring her here. I was still changing things on this presentation. Uh, if I'd known that the veils were here, I probably would have changed something else. But uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope you will appreciate, by the time we get through this session, a little bit more of what we mean by contemporary art. So uh, I think we need to turn this I'm not going to go with that yet, but very shortly. Where's my little piece of, oh, here we go. Now, you know, to have some fun tonight, it would be nice if you don't have any fear whatsoever that I'm going to try to trap you in anything, because that's not my nature, is it, Bonnie? Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, many of you, because you have been in my classes, know this one, so please don't volunteer to do it. But I want someone who I don't know or doesn't know me uh, be brave enough to come up here and simply draw a, a very simple square on this board. <laughs> Judge? No, I know you won't come up. Uh, Steve, you're a good sport, come on. Uh, from one Yaley to another, he's going to show you a square. A square? A square, just a square, yeah. <laughs> Those of you who are laughing are just as guilty as the perpetrator. Okay. Okay. Now wait, all of you think of how you would have drawn it, okay? Have you got the image in your mind? All right, here we go. Boy, I picked the right guy. I can tell. Okay. We've got an architect in the group. Did he do a good job with that, Jim? Uh, let me see a show of hands. How many would have imagined doing it the same way? Okay. Invariably, I, I've done this so many hundreds of times. Christy, what does this represent in terms of how we tend to deal with a, a situation like draw a square. Well, it represents, I think, what we, how we picture a square, but it really kind of represents the time allotted to do it. If you're caught up in front of a group, you're going to do something about it. Okay. But almost everyone invariably will draw it now. If I had said instead of just draw a square, if I'd been more specific and said, would you draw a square using only dots? Can you imagine doing it? No one ever does, but you can imagine doing it. Okay, draw a square using only parallel lines. Jim, you're... No, no. This isn't parallel to this. Okay, but I didn't say two sets. I said only parallel lines. Can you imagine it? Yeah. How, how, how would you do it, Chris? Uh, well, I'd probably use a yardstick, but I would just make lines all the way down and then make lines out to the side so I had surrounded that thing without making those lines. Yeah. If I had, let's say, 50 horizontal lines parallel, I would be able to create a square, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what does this tell us? Perception. No, we're all trapped in preconception. Also, Steve drew this because the given 
is rectangular, he drew it as everyone does. These edges are parallel with these edges. Now, no one told you to do this, but again, the given gets in the way of probably a different way of viewing the possibilities. Now, if I'd said you may not use dots and you may not use lines, I wanted a solid shape. Can you all visualize what you had done? The shape would have been what? Probably black on a white ground because the ground is preconceived. This is background. And as you'll see in the lecture, it took hundreds of years for the Greek archaic to realize that even though the clay body is red and they paint black figures on it, hundreds of years later someone said, well, let's paint the background black and leave the figures red. And so whenever you see a red figured vase, of course it signify, well this has to be classic, not archaic. But it took that long for someone to do the reverse. Well, this particular assignment in my design class over a period of five to six weeks, every day someone would come in with another breakthrough. For example, someone finally came up with the idea of putting the square in perspective. So now they took into account this isn't a flat space, but a three-dimensional space. Someone else folded it, but it still had to represent a square. It had to be a folded square. And on it goes. Okay. Now, another victim. Who would like to draw a real R for me? Right here. You, you have it easy. Just an R. Just an R. Yeah. Oh, he's good. Did you want to sign that? Oh, okay. All right. A real R. Uh, anyone uh, care to draw an abstract R? No, 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 no. I, I, you know, poor victims. Okay, have you all imagined how you would have drawn it? Okay. Okay. Whoa, excuse me. May I help you? Is this an abstract R? Okay, what's the definition of abstract? Not realistic. Uh, taken, taken from, abstracted from, taken from. Okay, Something. literally, abstract means to take from. Well, what are you taking it from? Because a lot of people will not draw this. They will draw a distorted R. A distorted. Okay. Uh, is this an abstract R? What's it taken from? The mind of man. It's not out there. You can't find an R tree somewhere and pluck an R off. Uh, this is an abstraction. Is a photograph an abstraction? To take from. To abstract. Uh, in the law, an abstract is what? <laughs> well, if it, I'll go to my second authority, another judge. The, the background of the person, the 
the background of the person. But if I, if I do an abstract in writing, it's generally what? Another attorney. Yeah. <laughs> the essence, yeah. So when we abstract something or we are looking for the essence, it, it doesn't get into all of the verbiage and whatnot. It gets right to the core. So we have in art terminology that can be very, very confusing. And with this, uh, if you want to start, isn't that a beautiful projector? <laughs> By the way, can you all hear over there? Because we've got all kinds of chairs here. I'd really appreciate it if we could take about five or eight of you and just sit you in here. Then I don't, I don't get as much exercise in my neck, but that would be great. Okay, uh, have most of you seen this piece? Do you know who did it? Picasso, Picasso okay. Uh, would you consider this an abstraction? Uh, a lot of people also equate art with something which is the handiwork of an artisan. In other words, craft as well as concept or idea. And we look at this, which was done probably 100 years ago or close to it. Would this be considered contemporary? All right, the, modern, the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. Modern art? The artists that are in there, uh, I remember going in to see when I was in New York in 1960, and there was Picasso's Guernica, and it's now in Madrid. But how long ago was that painted? How long ago was this fashioned? Is this contemporary? Is it modern? Well, the art historians come, I don't know who names these periods, but what comes after modern? Now it's postmodern. <laughs> what it comes after impressionism? Post impressionism. What comes after Dick Nelson? <laughs> okay. What we have then is a terminology that can be very confusing, especially if people just don't really in any way verify what this word really means. For example, you know, when you go in and you look through a, a, a gallery, such as the one at the MAC, we just had an incredible show, the uh, Portrait Challenge. Now, if you go through that, most people that I have gone through with, oh, I like that. I, oh, I like that. No, I don't care what the, you know, as those of you who have taken some classwork with me in the critique, we never address the issue of taste. I like it, fine. You like an onion, I don't like an onion. It tells me nothing about the onion. None of the nutritional values, none of the elements of sweetness or whatever. So we rule this out as I'm going to this evening, rule out I like it, I don't like it. And contemporary art, whether you like it or don't like it or even know what it is before you like it or dislike it. Let's take a, a look at it in a historical context. So if we go back to Paleolithic and Greek Hellenistic, you might say, well, is the artist who did the bison on, or the horse on the cave wall, is he contemporary? Uh, you, you're not allowed to say anything because you're an insider on this thing. Okay. How about it, guys? Exactly. Of his day, he was contemporary. How abstract is this? 
incredibly abstract and it's so incredibly modern in the sense of recognizing in the abstract that not only does he want to show the animal in the figurative sense of anatomy correctly, but you might ask yourself, why is it he connects this leg and not this? This leg and not that. Did he run out of paint? Every single time he does this, he makes this same abstract statement that this leg is in front, this leg is behind the torso. By interrupting, not by chance, he tells you this is in front of this. It's like if you're drawing a map and I said, on the map you've got to clearly define whether the railroad track goes over the highway or under the highway. How do you show it? You interrupt it. Very, very sophisticated abstraction. Okay, the Hellenistic, the little jockey on the horse. This is now not on the wall, but it is cast. It's in bronze. It's anatomy, it's action, everything is almost as though you were right there. Again, we have the definition that Steve gave me, and I think many of you would share. If you were living in the Hellenistic Greek period, this would be contemporary. Okay, next one. All right, the red and the black figured vase I just talked to you about before. Let's see if you really listened. Which one was earlier? Here we have a black figured vase. Here we have a red figured vase. The clay body is the color of the terracotta you see here. And the artist is using a black paint or on which he applies over the fired piece. So, earlier? No. No. This is classic Greek, archaic. So, if you now look at these two, and if you said, well, at this particular time in Greek history, when they were painting black figured bases, it is contemporary. But, as we have found, there might be artists or ceramicists doing this during the classic period. And if they're still plating black figures on a clay body, are they contemporary? Just because they're living in that time, are they still contemporary? Okay. We seem to have some disagreement. How many say that if I am still painting black figured vases in the fifth century, I am a contemporary? Okay, I have to disagree with you, but this is gonna make it lively a little while. Okay, there's another factor here, which you may not be able to see because the images are too small. But the attention to detail, the attention to anatomical correctness will vary greatly in the two. But I think we'll see it better in sculpture, so next slide. Now, we're comparing the classic versus the archaic, but in this case, it's not one of ceramics, but now you, I think, can clearly see a separation here of not just style, but of something more. The style suggests to me something that was, of course, seen first with the uh, Egyptians. In the Koros figure, we term this the arrested walk. It doesn't mean if you walk this way you get arrested, but it, he is absolutely imprisoned psychologically, enclosed within a vertical shaft. Now, what was he like 
in terms of his view of the world at this time. Because humanism had not yet arrived, the Greeks still at this point looked to the forces of nature as something beyond their comprehension, and they almost worship all of these things in sense of, if I do, maybe I can come through this all right, but everything I do, I could be a victim of all these natural forces. And it's not my fault, it's just all these natural forces are working against me. Ah, but then the Greek classic, man stands alone, separate from nature, humanism. Man now is at the center. Greek tragedy now is possible because now I take responsibility for my own action. And if I take responsibility for my own action, I'm no longer a teenager. I can no longer go to dad to be bailed out of this accident. I am now standing in human form. Here, little incised lines suggest anatomy, stylized. The proportions, yes, they began to look, there were knees or all these anatomical things, but now it is replicated. Now this is man. Ah, but what kind of man? Not man as we are, but man young enough to have the perfect body, the perfect features, idealized. And so humanism and man at the center begins to direct something away from something chiseled out of a rectangular stone. And if I gave you a piece of clay or not, yeah, a piece of clay, one person has clay, another person has a bar of soap, and I say carve a human figure, invariably, like the square, invariably the one with the soap will have a front two sides and a back. In other words, the figure that you carve out of it will be restricted by your preconception, by the given, a rectangular block of stone, or totem pole, a column, everything held within it. So you say, well, of course, my God, you've got bronze. You don't have to be you know, carved out of stone. This is fashioned with a very plastic substance. And I now apply this plastic substance on an armature and I create something which can reach out. So now it's not this, but this. And so psychologically, philosophically, this is in tune with its time. So if there's a guy down the road still chiseling away with a block of marble or granite or whatever. Do you see what my point is? That when you are infused with a whole new sense of who you are and what you believe, your work will mirror this and it will, in its very structure, tell you who and why behind all of this. That this is a totally different man as, we, as he sees himself. And you say, well, now, wait a minute, Dick. You know, no one really knew anatomy here. I mean here, but they did there. The question, well, why would they want to know anatomy? Because this is the whole core of art history. Because if we recognize this, the appearance of reality, not the appearance of reality. There are other elements where our value systems may confuse the whole issue. Because most people looking at art, I think bring to it, well, gee, my five-year-old could probably do that. Anyone who could take a bicycle seat and handlebars and make a bull out of it, hell, I could do that, I'm an artist. No, no, you've missed the whole thing. That we will find that the motivation to make it out of bronze, to make it possible that he is reaching out now and is not confined, is such a powerful element that we see through the whole history of art, as you'll see. Okay, next. For example, 
One is done in tempera, the other in oil. One, a Byzantine icon, the other, Raphael, high renaissance. You say, well, boy, there was a great, great gap here that we saw with the archaic Greek to the classic. Here, she is on a gold background. Here, she's in an environment with aerial and linear perspective of space. Here, she is developed with chiaroscuro, developing lights and shadows, making it round and believably of this world. This is not. Therefore, this must be inferior. Well, they couldn't possibly, at that particular time, which, by the way, hundreds of years after the Greeks. So don't tell me they can't draw. I mean, they have never seen realistic art. Of course they have. But their interest now is on that world, not this world. She is in a gold environment, other world. And this is an age of faith. God now, not man, God is at the center. And because God is at the center, all things are God's. Therefore, the material, corporeal, flesh and blood of this world has little or no interest. Look at the proportions or the lack of understanding of the physical, visual world, and then compare it with the high renaissance. Where humanism, renaissance, rebirth, what? Rebirth of humanism. So we're right back to the Greek classic, on full cycles. You see the repeat? Now, is this a real Madonna? No. Idealized, like Zeus, the bronze statue of Zeus. Not man as he really is, man as we would like him to be. And so consequently, it's the perfect proportions, even to the classic colors and to what's considered a closed form composition and all of the elements which identify with reason. Man at the center again. And if you think of da Vinci's man in the square, in the circle, the measure of all things, not God, 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 yes, Christian meaning, but it was humanism imbued with Christian meaning that made the big change. So don't tell me if they had not been interested or concerned with this world or our physical being, our flesh and blood, they couldn't have done it. Yes, they could have. If it had been, I think, all they had to do was look at any of the Greek statues or Roman paintings. The Romans were very much of this world. So again, we had people at this time and today, painting in tempera. You say, well, why not? Okay, why did they go to oil? Because if you've ever tried to paint in tempera, you're using egg yolk. It's very sticky and a little tiny, almost single hair brush. And trying to model lights and shadows, as we see here with Raphael, to get this chiaroscuro moving across ever so smoothly. Oh, it was much easier if we just took linseed oil, added it to the pigment instead of egg yolk, and look how we could blend. You say, well, that's the reason why this looks so primitive and why this looks, no, again, like the bronze. Now, I've got to be able to model this and, you know, we've got to find some way, some technique, and consequently the oil. The linseed oil made it possible now to render a scene such as we have here. Which is contemporary? Grace Cathedral, Knob Hill, San Francisco, or Rand's Cathedral, French, Gothic? What, Christy? I said Rand's Cathedral. How many would pick Grace Cathedral as contemporary? All right, it was built in our time. 
in its time, the Gothic cathedral was what? <laughs> an encyclopedia of an age of faith. All things were God, not man. No. This is before the Renaissance. And so man is not at the center, but God. You might find a stained glass window of a furrier selling furs to a customer, and you'd say, well, that has no business in this cathedral. That is a non-religious scene, a furrier selling his furs. But everything, everything was God's world, everything. And so we had a building which, unlike the Romanesque, which I won't show you because we don't have time, it's, it's like a sponge. If I said, well, where is the surface of that building? Could you go and touch it? And like a sponge, oh, it just permeates. You can't really identify a solid wall. Why? Because the iconographics, everything was centered on the other world and the light of God filtering in through this and into the inner chamber. So this would be considered an internal architectural scheme. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. In other words, it's motivated so that the magic and the light of God coming through the stained glass windows in this space so unbelievable in height that you were caught up in this entire spiritual feeling of that world, age of faith, the spiral. Uh, I picked the wrong slide here, but the spire. In the medieval, going from the ground or the earth and diminishing to the spirit. In other words, the corporeal flesh and blood of this world tapers off into. And so it was the light of God, the divine, that made it possible for them with uh, stained glass windows, which then required flying buttresses to support all of this. It was motivated to be inside for the experience. Not that the outside was not. But. And then comes along Grace Cathedral. Was Grace built in the time of Age of Faith? Not at all. Not at all. We now believe that we could know the ultimate reality. In the age of faith, it was on the faith that the ultimate reality was to be discovered after death. And so Grace Cathedral, and if you're a good Episcopalian, you may take exception to my, my views, I would say is not contemporary at all. Because to be contemporary, would be to recognize, as we have seen so far, who you are, where you are in this world, and your worldview will shape your architecture, your great architecture, and it will shape your sculpture and your paintings. And so Grace Cathedral is thinking 14th century in the 20th century. So I by my definition would say, this is not contemporary. Next. Now, if we look at the Parthenon, the Greek classic, versus the same cathedral rams, is the Parthenon contemporary? Yes. yes. Just as was the Greek Poseidon or Zeus. Why? Because the philosophy was humanism, man taking his place in competition with, in competition with nature. So when you look at an architectural form which is primarily geometric, geometric, where'd that come from? From man, from reason. All the ratios that are worked out are really conceived in humanism. And here is a white marble building, which was also elaborately painted, standing on an acropolis in full view of the city of Athens as a monument to man. Yes, 
the goddess Athena was inside and on the Panasonic procession every by year, they would go in and, and be able to enter this. But this is more sculpture than it is architecture, in that it was external in its beauty. And all these columns, even the number of columns and the entasis or the slight bulging of the columns gave it uh, almost a, a life. And if you cite down this, uh, all of these elements of the horizontal, they're not, they're no straight lines. They're all bowed. It rises. So here is man in competition and yet also in relation to nature. But if I, for example, had shrubbery around my house and I go out and I clip all of the shred, uh, all of the uh, shrubbery into spheres, rectangles, you would look at it, you'd know I had a gardener, I was pretty damn good at this, thing, but I'm imposing my will on nature. Because nature doesn't grow in little spheres. And so here is a monument to man. Here is a monument to God. Age of faith. Humanism, quite different. The philosophy affects the art. Now, what if, what if, in the 12th, 13th century, these guys were building this cathedral, said, you know, we've got to think like the people at Grace Cathedral, Knob Hill, San Francisco. We can't build our own architecture. We have to use a Greek temple. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Sure, you can build one. You might build it just as well as the Greeks did with all the tools you've got now. And so people in the 20th century build a Grace Cathedral to the glory of not this century or, or of our time. And so if the people who designed and built these great cathedrals of the Gothic era were held in one foot back in the Greek classic, you can see there'd be no contemporary architecture of the Gothic era. Next. Major breakthrough. Ghiberti had a contemporary, Brunelleschi, who in the 16th century decided, you know, we really, if we're, we've got our act together, we really believe in humanism, and Florence, Italy is the center now, the new Athens, the new Athens, Renaissance, rebirth. Okay, we swing right back to humanism again. What is there in Ghiberti's bronze doors? By the way, how many of you have ever seen these in person? Don't miss it if you have a chance. And I can imagine what it must have been like in the 15th century when the people from all over that Italian peninsula heard of these bronze doors because he's doing something that had never been done before. And that was to put in bronze a sense of space well beyond the real space. We all know that these figures here are you know, three-dimensional. But how does he describe how this space works when it's only an inch deep? Can you see any device? Pardon? Okay. Overlapping. But also, notice how deeply he cuts in and graves the figures in the foreground and how shallow they become as they go back in space. So he also understood the concept of atmosphere. And you say, okay, uh, he took the whole law of perspective from Brunelleschi, who was his contemporary and who, in fact, lost the competition to do the doors. What is there in this that tells us this is humanism? Why isn't this like our icon period of Byzantine? Question, is he interested in this world? Yes. Yes, with the physical world? Yes. These are real looking 
settings, real looking people, anatomically correct. And can you imagine, before television now, before computers, people coming in from Umbria and they walk into the, wow, and here is this, they've never seen anything so magical. Yeah. That's like my boy, my mom. But, but they could see the perspective. That's how I really see it. And they never understood that before Brunelleschi. So, yes, Geberti was of that time. And he took this that Brunelleschi came up with. Geberti fashions this into one of the most incredible pieces of architecture, but it, on the cutting edge. No one had ever done this before. Okay, next. All right. What are we comparing now? A statue that we're very familiar with. One is Baroque, one is Renaissance. Which is the high Renaissance? David. David. Okay. How many of you have seen this original? Okay. Uh, I think the thing that startles a lot of people, when you've only seen it on a slide and then you walk in, and my God, this thing is 18 feet high. It's enormous. But what makes one different from the other? Okay, if you look at David by Michelangelo, Is he carrying out any act? What's he holding on his shoulder? A sling. And he's looking at whom? Goliath. Okay. So he's looking at Goliath. And what's he about to do? Take him on. But to the Greek classic and to the Renaissance art, it was not the, po uh, the anticlimax but the climax of the action, which was important. Well, what do I mean? Well, why is this the climax? Why is this anticlimactic? Okay, for example, yeah, if I said, uh, I'm going to end this lecture in, you all, uh, in about two minutes. Okay, I've made a decision. When we then carry it out, it's sort of anticlimactic because the audience already knows you know, that I'm going to do this, assuming that I do what I say I'm going to do. And so here is typical humanism, renaissance, action in repose. Action in repose. He's standing in a contrapostal pose, placing all of his weight on one leg, which we saw with a Greek classic and Hellenistic. Look at the size of his hands. <laughs> Huge. Okay, but it's the decision. He's making the judgment, this I will do. It's here. It's all here. This I'm carrying out, anticlimactic. One idealized, the other the way we are, quite realistic. So again, not only do we have the Renaissance going back to the Greek, but now we have the Baroque, which is going back to the Hellenistic, like the little boy on the horse, the jockey. The world as it really is. But there are so many dimensions and to me, without the understanding or appreciation of how this new Athens or this humanism will control the art that's produced by it. And when you're not in sync with your philosophy, with your belief, and who you are, your art is as shallow as a puddle. There's no depth because you don't know really who you are or what you're trying to say. So for me, the definition, contemporary, yes. Contemporary, yes. If I'm doing this at this time in history in the Baroque, I'm not contemporary. 
because mind has changed and art has changed. And when the two separate, you may still have a foot in the path. Henry Ford divine, divine, de, designs a new car. What's it look like? A horse-driven carriage without the horse. So one foot still back there. So as, as we look at our own artwork, where are we? Who am I? Do we even know? Next. For example, taking what we just saw in sculpture. How many of you have ever seen this? And can you bring the same lesson that we just saw as we compared the Renaissance with the Baroque? Here is Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Where are you, the audience? You're in the audience. This is taking place on the stage. You are not invited to the table. All of these figures are idealized. They're not man as he really is, but as we would like him to be. Where, when the Italians looked at Caravaggio's Supper of the Mass, they said, oh my god, it looks like Luigi down the road who does my hair. <laughs> He's not idealized. Uh, this is kind of crazy. Look at this. And where are you, the viewer? You're at the table. You are part of this. And so the reason, rational explanation, here is the world as we would like it to be, classic Greek Renaissance. Here is the world with Jesus and all as real flesh and blood human beings. Here we see it in the light of day so that we can clearly see where one outline of one figure ends and another begins. Nothing is left to your imagination. In contrast, Caravaggio, where does the hair end and the background begin? Where, and there was a piece in the Portrait Challenge, right out of Caravaggio. If you think back, of it, if you've seen the exhibit. Because the artist apparently wanted that same infusion that wanted to get the, the viewer involved emotionally with the image. And you do, you do that by allowing the viewer to imagine, fill in the details. And this is what is considered by Heinrich Wolfson a painterly approach. We don't see every leaf on the tree. What we do see, or all the lace on the collar, we see it at a glance. So this is a world not only like David saying, Goliath, I am taking you on. One of you will betray me. It is a, that classic moment. Also, this is on the stage. We're in the audience. We're here. This is reason, passion. That doesn't mean that Caravaggio could paint this without reason or that there was no passion in this. But the shift from the 16th into the 17th century, from the Renaissance into the Baroque, was a major shift in trying not to intellectualize, but rather take that reason and infuse it with emotion. And how do you do that? By a recessional device that places you right at the table by lighting, which is intimate, by real people. And so again, the link between what we believe, what we feel, or what we think, and our artwork is in sync. And so both are contemporary. And when I think of all of the people who followed both camps, but not knowing why, and to me, this breaks my heart when I look at my own contemporaries, my artists around me today. And they haven't a clue where this came from. They simply had an instructor who said, paint this way, or this is the way you paint a cloud, this is the way you paint a foot. And they have no linkage whatsoever with, I remember at a cocktail party at Christmas time, 
asking this gal from Hunter, well, what are you painting now? She said, waterfalls. I said, no, what are you painting? Waterfalls. What are you painting? She walked away. Hadn't a clue. Of, you know, for example, water, we're 98, what percent water? I mean, you, you can carry this in a lot of ways, but my God, when you don't feel who you are or what you're trying to say, what in the hell does your art mean? Just some pretty little thing to have on a wall, I guess. Goes with a sofa. Okay, next. Okay. Now, here's a, a, an interesting situation. We have a painting by anyone identify? Renaissance. Kishin? Good. Okay, and not Manet, Manet. We have a French woman from, in fact, we have two. Okay. Now, do you see anything rather disturbing? Because a lot of Parisians did when they saw the painting. The Olympia on the right, 19th century. Do any of you know the label that art historians have given to this? The naked Maha? Uh, no, no, that's uh, Goya. I'm oh, sorry, Goya. that's Spanish. But No, what I'm saying is uh, by uh, the, the period was realism, renaissance, late renaissance. Would you be upset? Doesn't anything bother you? The fact that that composition was right straight out of Titian. A nude reclining. What made it contemporary? How can you call it contemporary when you copied something that was done in the 16th century and this is 300 years later? Okay. Which one is idealized? Which one was a prostitute? I've got to watch that word after my bout at uh, Art Maui. I don't know if any of you were in on that, but I made myself quite unpopular. Uh, Venus. Is this Venus? No. She was a known prostitute in Paris. Okay. So what in the world is he doing? You say, well, they gave him a label, realist. And most of my art history students really stumble on this one because they say, well, how can you say this is realism because he's not using any chiaroscuro. Here the figures are carefully modeled in lights and shades. Here it's just flat like a poster. white against another kind of white, against still other kinds of white, a black cat, which we can hardly see, and the white flowers and a white wrap and a light pink, white, negro, black and white, flat. How can you call it realism? Well, again, my dear friends who label these things in art history, I don't know where they come up with these things. What would be real about it? The thing that most people would never get unless they took by course. No. What is real is Manet is saying, look at it. Not her, not the subject. Look at it. Because all art prior to this, oh, it's Venus. And Venus, et cetera, et cetera. And you could bring all the iconographics, everything else. What Manet is asking us to do, this is, folks, a painting. It's not a nude on a couch. Yes, that's the subject. But it's a painting. There is paint on this. It's on a canvas. And so the word was coined art for art's sake. Have you ever heard it? A lot of people have lost it. <coughs> so we have, as Gilberti and his bronze doors now opened a window, but to an audience that hadn't a clue what, to see, what they're looking at. Because this appeared to be a real step back. Oh my God, you forgot how to draw? You forgot chiaroscuro? You forgot all of the niceties of 
what happens in the, the Renaissance painting, and you pick, of all things, a prostitute? What a subject. Whistler's mother. I don't have a slide for you on it. What was the correct name? Not Whistler's mother. An arrangement. Of, OK. It was an arrangement. In other words, as with this man, Manet, contemporaries, the most important element was to look at it. Example, I'm giving a workshop up on Columbia Gorge, the Watercolor Society of Oregon, and Jack, one of my students, comes in after a day out on the field, and it's now critique time. It's after dinner, and he puts his painting up, and there's Mount Hood, and right in the middle of Mount Hood is a telephone pole. And everyone in the critique said, Jack, why did you put a telephone pole right in the middle of the most important part of the painting, is Mount Hood? He said, well, it was there. It was like, you know, if someone drove out there and got in the same spot that he was with his easel and saw, oh, Jack, you forgot the telephone pole. Manet would have seen it immediately, not as a telephone pole, not as a subject, but as a vertical separation between the right and left side of the painting. Art for art's sake. No, it's not a... And it's very difficult to reach your audience when we have, by and large, people who have no art background except maybe one year of art class. And people keep asking, well, Dick, why don't you paint something we can understand? Well, that would be like asking Shakespeare to write, run, Jane, run. Then, oh, everyone, but no, we have 12, 13 years of English. We're all literate, most of us. And if I use a double negative, you go, know, ooh. But if I don't understand perspective or I don't understand color relationships or whatnot, no one knows the difference because they don't know, period. And I'll be damned if I'm going to be painting Run, Jane, Run. Because I think in the history of art, we have seen ourselves through the eyes of the artist in such a unique way, in such a universal way. Why in the world don't we have universal literacy and vision? Next. The initiators. Taking Manet, Cezanne goes another step and says, you know, it's not just the reality that this is a canvas with oil paint on it or watercolor on paper or whatever. That's looking at it. But now Cezanne blows everyone away by something that someone would say, well, that's really distorted. It's abstraction in the sense that if you, and I have to go back, I was in a graduate class of painting. There were 12 of us at Yale taking this painting class. And the only thing Cy Silman, my instructor, said was, Dick, you guys are used to painting this in art school. Now you're in grad school, I want you to paint this as well, speaking of the orange. And so I'm looking down on a table, and here are eight oranges. And we're all trying to figure out, my god, how do I paint that? I can paint this. Or why would I want to paint that? Well, the point was, when you look at an Impressionist painting of apples or a Renaissance or Baroque painting of apples, you saw it from one point of view. I was standing here, here was the scene, the still life is down there. But is that reality? If you want to do, say, well, I, I really know Dick Nelson. No, you don't. You know me as a teacher, maybe, or as a lecturer. But you don't know me as my son does, or as my wife did. There were many different things. And so what we're doing in this instance now is telling you more than what you could see at a particular time of day. The Impressionists wanted a particular moment. Stop all the trains in San Lazar Station, says Monet, so I can paint them. No, no. It's not the particular. It's not the here and now. It's the universal. In other words, that orange, that apple, not just in this particular position relative where I am, but if I move, it's going to look different. It's going to shift. 
And people say, well, that's crazy, that's crazy. Well, it's contemporary thinking because the camera had come into play. We have all these things reshaping our modern world. And someone comes up with a concept, not his own, because it began with Manet. Look at it, not through it. Begin to question all these things. And so consequently, the contemporary art scene began to see this not as a replication. So when people say, well, this isn't realistic, oh, folks, this is probably more realistic because it's not like the prostitute saying I'm someone else. It says, I'm a painting. It's not trying to fool us with magic like we had seen with Ghiberti's bronze door. This is paint, folks, or this is on canvas, and this is trying to tell you something about your world will change. And what's fascinating is that this almost coincides with where we were in the molecular world of atomism. And so we see again a lineage going by questioning who are we, what do we believe, and the artwork beginning to reflect that. And then Picasso and Brock and Cubism take it another step further until it's very hard to find the subject matter at all. So if you're not, and this is the hardest task for those people who are painting things such as this because, you know, when you go up to it, the first question most people would say, not having any art background, is, well, what is it? And then they'll read the label, oh, that's what it is. There was a Frenchman, I can't remember the name, who did the pipe, remember? He did a little painting. He, uh, of a pipe, and he said, the title of it, this is not a pipe. And everyone looked at it, it was almost photographic, it was so realistic. They said, how, how, what was the name? Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the guy said, what do you mean it's not a pipe? I mean, it has all of the elements, all of the grain of the wood, everything. He said, try to smoke it. <laughs> And so we have this incredible separation now between your lay people, your audience, so to speak, and the artist. And, you know, they don't understand because they can't communicate in the same language. And that's a shame. And I think both sides are somewhat at fault. So what I've tried to do, and I recommend maybe you, you work on this yourself, is to, in uh, get yourself a list, because it may not be like mine at all, but I'm trying to find and identify with where am I, who am I in this day, what things are affecting me and possibly my art. And so I just began, you know, some of the things that came to mind. My God, when I was growing up, we didn't have texting or computers or whatnot, so obviously, is that going to be affecting me and my artwork in any way? I remember my mom saying, Dick, Get off that computer, for God's sakes. That's going to ruin your art. I find my computer is like having a studio full of apprentices. Example, I want, always wanted to do a three-dimensional color wheel. Some of you have seen this. It took me six weeks to do it in a graphics program, full three-dimensional, because I want to be able to fly through it, do everything with this three-dimensional object. I could never have done it without the help of that computer because I told the computer what to do and then I walked away and for 15 minutes I come back and it's all rendered. Where Disney would have a crew all painting singular images forever and ever. And so, yes, I'm embracing the 21st century, the 20th century, my God, yes. But uh, there are some things that are clearly going to affect us all. Next. And so I've just started a list and from time to time look at my own artwork and wonder, you know, have any of these, these events in any way changed the way I work or, or see the world? And I guess the most devastating is after you've worked on a piece for a month or two, you have it up on the wall and your colleagues come in 
and I'm very blessed. I've got a lot of very good friends and students, and they'll come into my studio and into my living room. They won't even give a, a quick glance, not a, even a quick glance. Not only my work, but I have worked with my students. People just don't pay any attention to it. And I'll tell you, that's dev devastating. And so, uh, again, on my list, I'm saying, you know, no one's paying any attention to not only my art, but I was watching here the other day, tourists coming through. You know, I've heard two, two seconds is, is pretty good for work, but people are going through. <laughs> I mean, not even looking. You wonder, why in the world am I doing this? I don't have an answer. Next. Okay, now comes judgment time. Is contemporary better? For example, if I had looked through this show and I said, well, that's not contemporary, that is contemporary. Is that a good judgment or a bad judgment? It's a personal perception. It's relative. Yeah. It's relative. All right, how many of you are here today? Yeah. 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 How many are in this room that are in this show? That's kind of frightening in a way, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. But if I were in this show, I think I'd be here tonight. I, I, I know I scare people, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, Christy, is your work contemporary? I think so. I think so. Okay. I can't give a... Def a, a clear definition. But I do know that our, our scene has changed dramatically. Everything that I ever learned in art school, in graduate school, has been absolutely turned upside down. Absolutely turned upside down. What was good is now bad, what was bad is now good, and Melissa's smiling over here because we've got an ongoing thing going with this. Con Let's take a look at the slide here. This came to me this week from the University of Hawaii Art Department. Invitation, art exhibit. Well, I didn't hear applause. I didn't hear boos or hisses. Well, that's because there's a lot, it's trying to, trying to take it in. There's what? Because to me, the first reaction is to try to take it in and understand something. What are you taking in? looking at the content and quality of the two photos and seeing what relationship they may have. Okay. Will you agree with me? You cannot use Manet's statement, look at it. Is the subject matter more important than color? Probably. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. It's concept. It's concept, folks. And what it's saying to me, and may I sound a little defensive, is that what in the world all of this has to do with visual communication? OK. Just as a contrast, I'm sorry because I try to be neutral in most of my lectures, but I'm so emotionally caught up in this. This was sent to me by a Canadian artist last week. And I wanted to share it with you.
if you ask, what is it? There is no answer, because it's nothing but what you see. And either you like what you see or you don't. So we have, in this very period of art history, two contemporary artists, one probably 22 years old, a senior in art school at the University of Hawaii, and this gentleman here. Of which one is contemporary, or both? And so, it's very difficult to define. As this rascal here asked me at a dinner party the other night, Dick, uh, give me a definition of art. And the only one I could think of, which I thought was quite profound, was in Jansen's History of Art, which was the textbook I used when I was teaching. And Jansen says, you know, when they had only a bison on the wall of a cave, and you ask the cave Paleolithic, what, what's art? There it is. Then someone else comes along and creates something else, the definition expands and will keep expanding. You never get a handle on it. As long as man will continually create and break out and new possibilities, the definition with it will continue to grow. Where we're going with it, I think we're all too close to the scene to get the perspective on it, to really know. But uh, I think the quest, because I am human, and because this work is done by humans, for humans, that I, I think back when Archibald McLeish came to Yale and gave a speech on poetry. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I recorded it, I used it for years, and for some reason it's been lost, but I remember a few lines in it. And he said, you know, when you have front page reporting, that's the news. It's knowledge of a fact. And the good Germans who knew the gas ovens and the concentration camps and could live with that knowledge with ease and tranquility until the diary of Anne Frank. And for the first time, and I'm only quoting McLeish, for the first time, it wasn't knowledge of a fact, but a feel for the fact. A feel for the fact. And only poetry, only the arts, a bird that pecks out its existence is only surviving. All the animal kingdom, they know how to survive. But it's only man who has art. The only thing that really separates us from the animal. Think about it. Our music, our poetry, our literature. And that in itself is enough of a reason to champion this whole concept of more education in the cultural areas, not taking them away, giving more. Because that, my God, you don't have to look very far to see the, the madness that's going on in this world. But the knowledge of the fact is one thing, survival is one thing, but as McLeish says, if it's important to learn how not to die, it's equally important to learn how to live. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Karen, Karen has a, a commercial. Also, she does make me look good. But uh, we do have an art history class coming up. And it just happened to coincide here. So if you want to.
about March 13th. It would be nine weeks long, three hours per session, probably Friday mornings. And um, the we at Dick's studio, and we need at least eight people to enroll to hold the class. I'm taking um, people's input on the day of the week, because not every day works for people. And if we get enough people, we may be able to offer two sessions, but we need at least two. Is 8.30 immovable? 8.30? That's pretty much his preferred time. <laughs> Midnight <laughs> to 3? Yeah. No, I, I mean, for somebody in where I live, that's tough. It's pretty darn early, huh? <laughs> We will take input on that too. We can take requests and that can be negotiated. So anyways, um, I have some flyers if anybody wants the details. Um, my contact information is on here in case you want to get more information or find out about how to register. Um, or if you want to sign up and have me put you on our list to get notices of those other classes or to send you information about this class. Any questions? Thank God. <laughs> <laughs>